My name is Hugo Bernier. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. And today I'm going to be talking to you about custom properties part two, because a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago now, we actually started with part one and we kind of ran out of time. But, uh, you know, these presentations are part of a, a series of presentation around SharePoint framework design patterns. This is about how to not only, you know, get started with using some of the technology like SPFX, but also how to best use these things. So what are some of the human interface design user experience principles and things like that, as well as teaching you some tips that you might not know about, even though you may have been uh, using SPFX for a while. So let's get started. When we last met our heroes, we were talking about Property panes, and if you don't remember property panes, is that thing that when you click on configure a web part or an adaptive card extension or a Teams app, it pops up that thing that allows you to configure it. And when we last presented, uh, we talked about all the various property field types, and this is just a, uh, an example of some of the property field types that are available. But if you remember, how we define those property fields. And EJAS just showed an example of this. But in your web part itself, in the web part.ts, you usually have a method called get property pane configuration. And get property pane configuration returns an I property pane configuration interface. So it's a class that, or it's not a class, but it's a structure that needs to have these attributes. And it needs to return a bunch of pages, a bunch of headers, or a header, and a bunch of groups. And inside of each group, you have something called group field. And it's an array. So you know we'll open the array with a square bracket, and then we'll pass the individual fields that we want to display with a comma. So here I have Boolean field, and then we go through all the fields, all the fields that I showed you, and we end the array. And that's really what we have to do to actually render some, some property fields and property pane. Now, unfortunately, you know, it would be cool to be able to just uh, drop some actual fields in the code, but we can't. So in the code, what we end up having to do is we have some helpers for each of the first party property pane controls, as well as some of the third party property pane controls, there's usually a helper that, for example, here, if I want to create a new property pane checkbox, I can just call property pane checkbox. Now, you may have noticed that EJAS used the new property pane async dropdown. That's actually how normally you would do, you know, anytime you want to create a new component, a new, a new object, you would create new something something. But each one of these controls have a, a helper that will automatically create a new, and it will use the parameters that are passed to actually understand how to create that. So here I have a property pane choice group, and so on and so forth. We have my drop down. I have all of them, right? I won't walk you through every single one of them, but those are all very handy helpers that will create those fields for you. Now, how I bind to those properties, you'll notice that for my checkbox, I have a property in my web part that I called from choice. And from choice uh, or from checkbox, from choice, and so on and so forth, right? Now, I probably didn't use the best naming convention for my properties here, but again, it was for the demo purposes. I was trying to show that this is binding to a checkbox or a choice or drop down. But where do these properties come from? Well, in your web part, you have the ability to create a, a property interface, our web part property interface, or what we call props. Here, I called mine I, my web part props, and I have an attribute for each one of those uh, values. So for example, I want to show my checkbox. And because we're using TypeScript, well, we want our values to be strongly typed. So I will specify that this is a Boolean. My choice is going to be a string, and so on and so forth. So now we have used the method to actually render the list of property pane controls. 
we've defined our properties and we've told SharePoint basically how to store this. Now, what if I wanted to set up some default values, right? Some pre-configured values. Well, in your web part manifest, so see here at the top, I say my web part dot manifest dot JSON. On my, my manifest, I actually have pre-configured entries and I have properties. And here, for example, I've actually defined you know, my checkbox, I want it to be true, my choice, I want it to be spring, and so on and so forth. You can absolutely do that. And the great thing about that is every web part can have more than one manifest, and those values can also be localized as well. So we'll we'll talk about that in a, in a different session where we talk about localization. So, but what if I wanted to create default values that are maybe dynamic? Right, so what if I wanted to create the default value is today's date, or I wanted to calculate some values, or maybe I wanted to pick some values, conditional values, based on another value that's been selected. Well, you can't really do that in your manifest because the manifest is intended to be static, but you can do it in your web parts on init method. So the on init method, as you can imagine, gets called when the web part gets initialized and it returns a promise so that in other words it basically says look i'm not going to wait for this web part to to render the on in it or to to return the on in it i'm just going to create a promise and when you're done just let me know and that way your web parts are a bit more responsive you're able to actually uh the system is able to go to every web part and say hey just so you know we're about to render you we're about to so please go initialize yourself and i'll come back later to render you so when we do that, one of the things that we can do is we can just return a new promise. And in this case, I'll I'll actually return the promise. I'll create an arrow function so that I don't have to create a whole you know name function somewhere else. And then I'll initialize the data. So in this case, I'll just say the date. If the date is undefined, then I want to set the date to today's date. Now, for the purpose of the demo, I pretend that I already had a variable called today's date, which had today's date. Now, you probably want to make sure that you verify that your properties are are undefined or are valid. So, right here, you probably want to make sure that before you overwrite the uh, the setting, that you always make sure that it's undefined. But you could also do this. Let's say a new selection has been made and you want to invalidate another option because it's no longer a possible choice. Or sometimes you have connected values. So for example, if I selected option A, I want option B and E to be available. But if I select option B, I don't want D and E, right? One of the things that people tend to forget about is they tend to forget to uh, override those values and set them to null so that behind the scenes, you might not be making the, the in your code, you might not be making provision for the fact that, you know, oh, D and E are populated, even though the, the user has selected option B, I'm just going to render, you know, as if uh, D and E were selected. So use this this approach to actually kind of invalidate and verify that the, the properties are configured properly. Now you might say, well, why wouldn't I just do this in the rendering code, right? What, why wouldn't I just, when I render the, the, the control, the web part, why don't I just make sure that all the values are, are proper? You should definitely always validate all the inputs that are coming in. But one of the things that we're trying to do here is one of the principles is you should make sure that all the inputs that are coming in from the web part properties, the web part data itself is always valid so that moving forward, we're able to work with that assumption, right? So that way you always know that your code is, is clean and has all the right attributes. All right, so your web part uh, on init method then needs to resolve, just otherwise your web part is gonna be waiting for you to resolve forever. So that's good. So far, we've defined some properties. We've defined some uh, web parts, uh, web part properties, some attributes and default values and fancy default values. But what about an out of box web part like uh, like this one here, which is uh, what we call a first party web part, right? A web part that was built by Microsoft. Here's the Quick Links web part. Now, the Quick Links web part has a few interesting things to it. 
The first thing is it's got a title property. But you may notice that the title property is not actually displayed in the property pane. Uh, and that's because we, we've talked about this before, you want as much directness as possible. So if it's possible for me to directly edit a property in the edit window or in the canvas or whatever you call that, that window there, uh, you should be able to do that. That's why the rich text web part allows you to edit the rich text directly in the page itself, not through the property pane. But what about uh, this thing here where you have a whole bunch of links? Is that a property? Is that content? And is it something that we should be able to search? Well, here's the problem, right? Uh, we probably don't want our users to be like confused. You know, I thought I found a web part that had this word in it or this title in it. How come I can't find it? Well, we have to remember that when people discover content, uh, we tend to discover content in three ways. One is we browse. And browsing is kind of clicking around, going to a page, and finding content through a discovery process. Now, the other way is if I know exactly what keywords I'm looking for, I should be able to search. And searching allows you to use a keyword and find the results you want, usually. But here's the problem. What if that web part's content, which is maybe stored as a property, what if that content is not searchable? So uh, I have an example of a web part that I built that is called uh, Office Hours, right? Which allows you to, if you have if you have a department or something like that, you can actually drop the web part on a page and you can specify what hours, uh, business hours, whatever, right? So what if someone's looking for office hours and you've dropped the web part on a page and that's the only thing in the entire SharePoint site that has the words office hours? And your users are like, I could have sworn I saw web part somewhere. I saw something. They don't know it's a web part, right? I saw something on a page that said office hours and I just can't find it. So that's the problem. And that's one, one of the things that we have to solve. The other thing we have to consider is the third way that we discover content is through subscribing. And subscribing, we're not talking about like the alert me thing. It's more about either the system determining by your previous actions or you by indicating I'm interested in this. You're telling the system that if something happens that's new related to this, I want to know because I'm too busy to actually look for more content. Let me know when there's new content. Show it to me on, you know, my my summary. Show me, show it to me in an adaptive card or something like that. Now let's look at another web part. So this is the Markdown web part, which is another great first-party web part, and it allows you to actually create Markdown content. Using the same principles we've talked about, you can actually go into the web part, you can edit the web part. But what if I had a whole article here or a whole, I don't know, company policies written as a markdown entry in a page? Again, your users don't know that it's a web part. They just think it's content. So how am I going to make that content searchable, subscribable? And of course, it's going to be browsable because I can click to it and I can find it. Well. In your web part, you have a method called get properties metadata. That method is probably not in your default web part, but you can absolutely add that method. And what it does is it returns an I web part properties metadata. And it gives you the opportunity to return basically a key value pair of for every property that you want to define, you can actually say that this property can be searchable, can be an image, can be a, a, a link or something like that. Here's that works. So for example, here, my title property, which I didn't show through the property pane, but it's still something that I've exposed through my web part. I probably want people to find my web part through, um, through the title. So if I have a web part called office hours, I should be able to find it. And to do that, I'm going to say is searchable plain text equals true. And that basically says that the title attribute, when I store it, will be searchable and it's going to be plain text. I could also store HTML values in my web part. 
And you can absolutely do that. You can actually say, is HTML string equals true? If you have an image and your web part stores an image, you can actually say that it's an image source. Now, the cool thing about image sources is we'll know also if you move images around and things like that, it will understand that it will try to update the properties, or at least that's the theory. I've never actually tested that. And same thing with URLs. Now, why would you do that? Well, one of the things that I've done in the past is I've created a web part that creates a uh, markdown charts. And one of the things that I do is when I get the markdown, I parse the markdown, I extract only the text so that people can actually, and I make the text a, a searchable plain text. Or I could convert it as a HTML and make it a HTML string. But the great thing about that is when you do that, now your users are actually, even though you're rendering a chart, something that is visual, and that's usually not searchable, because I have a hidden property that is stored as a plain text or as HTML string, now my users are able to find that chart, no matter where it is placed in my in my SharePoint environment, because the attributes are indexed. All right, so let's wrap this up. Next, we're going to be talking about extending property pane, so adding new types of controls like uh, we've seen earlier today. We're going to use the property pane controls, and we're going to show how to validate properties. These are some of the articles that I've used to describe some of the principles today, but that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Awesome, Hugo. Thank you so much. These are really fantastic sessions on setting the, the guidance for the design patterns and development patterns. Excellent job. Great feedback in the chat as well. Mm -hmm.